Okay, here we are, Dr. Alan Christensen here, and I'm joined with Dr. Ben Lynch. And we are so excited about, about this event. I've been aware of the MTHFR issues a bit and been aware of Dr. Lynch and his expertise for quite some time. And I've been aware that this has been relevant, especially for those with thyroid disease. You know, it's a big thing for all populations. But with thyroid disease, so many people are really just struggling, and there's all these little variables that need to come into place and be just right to really get health back again. And this is one of them, and I'm so jazzed to share Dr. Lynch with you and his expertise. So without any further ado, I'm just going to turn it over to him at this point. And it looks like <laughs> he was lost from the call. He should be back up again any second. You know, I'll give a quick intro as he's coming back again here. Um, what happens is that the body has a big need for certain nutrients. And nutrients play out in a couple different ways. You know, there's things that we need that we just don't get enough of. There's things that we need that we can't absorb properly. And there's other nutrients to where we need them, but they have to be activated or converted in the body. And that's the case in terms of folic acid. Dr. Lynch, you with us again? I am, yeah. Uh, sorry. sorry. I just gave you an incredible introduction. I talked about the, the UN work that you've done and the world peace and everything. And <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, you can tell them about the number, <laughs> number of spacewalks I've done. I, I, I talked about the first two. I didn't get to the third one, though. All right. Well, we'll say that one next time. <laughs> it's all yours, buddy. All right. Well, thank you. So, sorry, folks. This is the first time I've used this system, and uh, usually I'm technically savvy, but this one got me. Anyhow, um, so let's begin here and hopefully you guys can see my slides and so today we're going to be discussing thyroid disorders and the contributing genetic mutations namely MTHFR there are others and I also want to put a plug in for Dr. Christensen his expertise on the thyroid is vastly superior than mine and uh, he's a great one for thyroid so we will move forward here so the common disclosures um, you, we've got uh, I research here very, very hard, and I try to provide the most accurate information as possible. But of course, this information here is for informational and educational use purposes only. You, uh, talk with your doctor and uh, disclosure too. I'm in the president and CEO of SeekingHealth.com and also founder of MTHFR.net. And that is it. So, overview of this presentation. Why? Why are we doing this? And folate metabolism. So folate metabolism is pretty critical. A lot of you guys know about folic acid, but you don't know about methylfolate or folinic acid and other types of, of folate, which we'll get into that today as well. And what is MTHFR besides the nasty looking text message that you might be sending somebody <laughs> on a, via irritate you? Uh, but it's more than that. And what does it do in conjunction with the thyroid? You know, Ben, I, uh, Dr. Lynch, I mentioned very briefly when you were off that there's kind of three tiers to nutritional status. There's what we get in. You know, if we get enough molecules in our diet, do we get in our supplements? Then there's the assimilation, and there's this kind of this other tier of genetic variability on activation. And I kind of introduced that concept is that this is this can be a big missing link for a key nutrient, and it's not for lack of availability or not for lack of absorption. Yes, exactly. That's a great point, and I think that it's, uh, widely not understood, so that's really important. And so folic acid is a, we'll get into that, and I'll, I'll emphasize your point too here soon on that. Um, so the functions of folate. Now, you hear about folate a lot, and the functions of folate, I'm going to get into the basics of them, so just so you have a common understanding, a basic understanding. And one of the presenter that I listened to actually sometime this year had a great statement during his presentation and he said he finds Shakespeare in medicine and it sounds kind of dorky um, but I, I would agree with that and to me this sentence here is Shakespeare so the functions of folate in human physiology are relatively simple but the implications of their activity and dysfunction can be profoundly far-reaching now if you look at how important folate is, then you can see why um, I'm discussing this. Uh, dang it. 
I just pushed something I shouldn't have. So, uh, how are we doing with that slide right there, Alan? Functions at full eight. Uh, okay. Actually, yep. You see it? Yep, it's up. Okay, good. Yeah, there was something blocking me. All right. So the functions is full eight. So producing your DNA, okay, and and repairing it. So that, in a nutshell, is critical. Your skin on a daily basis is is regenerating itself. So that's DNA being produced. You might not think you're producing DNA on a daily basis, but you are. Your intestines, intestines inside the lining of your intestines, that's being repaired and regenerated on a daily basis. And if you're not repairing it, then you are susceptible to problems. Uh, single carbon metabolism, methylation. So methylation, we're not going to get into that significantly today, just the basics. But methylation is, is really critical at turning on and off genes. So some genes you want to have on all the time, some genes you want to have off. And also to make certain nutrients, you need methylation. So you've heard of creatine, you've heard of CoQ10, carnitine, phosphatidylcholine, all these require methylation. So, and neurotransmitter production. You all know about serotonin, melatonin, and then also certain compounds like histamine. This is also requires methylation and folate. And also to form your, your red blood cells, your white blood cells, and your platelets. So, you know, producing your blood is, is also folate. So, as you can see, folate is very, very critical. So, at a fundamental chemical level, most every major reaction your body does depends upon this. And if it's not right, just so many parts of your health can be impacted by that. Would that be safe to say? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I want to make a point right here that... It's one of my pet peeves, and folic acid does not equal folate. So I guess in a, in a broad sense it does, but to me folate is the biological um, active form of what your body uses of the different types of folate. Now folic acid is a completely synthetic nutrient that was created by man in order to be very shelf-stable and to be able to put in the supplements in order to prevent uh, neural tube defects, which is which has been great. I mean, there are less neural tube defects. But for those of us who have MTHFR, such as myself, and 50% of the population, then I think, to some de degree, I think using folic acid is not what we should be reaching for because it's not found in nature, and it has to go through a whole bunch of different reactions in the body in order to be used properly, and I'll get into that. Now... When we're discussing folate, what does that mean? It can, folate is an umbrella term, just like car. Okay, car, you've got Honda, BMW, Mercedes, uh, Ford, Chevy, and so on. So folate is an umbrella term for folic acid, folinic acid, methylfolate, tetrahydrofolate, and others. Okay? So let's look at this really quickly. So if you look at folic acid, which is the top, uh, molecule formation up here, and then you look at the bottom one, that's methylfolate, they look very, very similar, okay? And the only difference is that little red circle there that's circling uh, the the line, and that's providing a methyl group. So the only real big difference between folic acid and the at most active form of folate in circulation in your blood is that little line with CH3 on it, and that's the methyl group. And that is really, really important because as we discussed just moments ago, the functions of methylation, then you can see why this is really important. And now the work that has to be done to put that little methyl group on there is a lot, okay? So we'll just show you what that is. What that is. And so here you can see, now don't be overwhelmed by this. I'm just going to go step by step. So look at the very top, okay, you see folic acid, it's, that's provided by supplements and fortified foods, okay. Then you see a, a black arrow going down to DHF, and that's another type of folate, which you can get from just normal food, like uncooked leafy greens and beans and so on, okay. And that reaction, that if you get just synthetic folic acid from your supplements or your enriched fortified foods and your cereals and grains and your breads, that's a very slow enzymatic process to convert folic acid to DHF. It's very, very slow, okay? And since that is so slow, what can happen is then your, your 
blood can accumulate with what is called UMFA. And you see that arrow going down and to the right? That's UMFA. That's unmetabolized folic acid. And there's very little research on that, but that shows that it can actually inhibit part of your immune system, specifically your natural killer cells. So that's already two strikes in my book. One, it's slow to be converted to another active form. And two, it's, produ it's producing a compound that's not recognized by our body that affects our immune system. And that's not good. So then it goes through all these other enzymatic steps. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the details. So if you look at folic acid at the very top, and you look down way at the bottom there, you see the red 5-MTHF, 5-MTHF, okay? That's 5-methyltetrahydrofolate, otherwise known as methylfolate. And just right above that red text is MTHFR, okay? That is the enzyme that I've been researching for over two years, uh, probably two and a half, three years now. And it seems pretty ridiculous to be focusing on one little enzyme, but it's, uh, it's very, very important. Now look at that little yellow circle there with B2. That's, that's riboflavin. That's a very specific form of riboflavin. And keep this in mind throughout today's talk. Because if you see all the work that has to be done to get convert folic acid to methylfolate through that MTHFR enzyme, which could be defective in you or your loved one or a whole bunch of other people or your patients, then B2 is a required cofactor for that. That means in order to provide methylfolate, you need from folic acid, you need riboflavin, niacin, vitamin B6, B12, uh, vitamin C, zinc, and you need an acidic stomach. You, you can't be taking antacids, okay? So, and all possibly other uh, genetic mutations upstream of MTHFR. So it's pretty important. But again, keep in mind that little red circle with vitamin B2. Hey, Dr. Lynch, yeah. 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 data in the past, and just to give everyone a little bit more context, we're going to do some, some great content here over the next 25, 20 minutes. We're going to do some Q&A at the end. So you've got the option of putting in questions there's a bunch of awesome ones rolling in already, and we're going to get to several of those. And we're going to round this out with some really important action steps, exactly what to take away from this, what you need to do about this, and what steps to take in terms of testing or any applications. Um, quick aside here, some of these byproducts from the folic acid, I've seen data here and there about possible risks for colorectal cancer from too much of the synthetic. So are there actual negatives to, to having this stuff and not utilizing it properly? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, folic acid can do a lot of negative things. Um, one, it can, you know, produce that unmetabolized folic acid, which reduces your poss possibly reduces your ability to produce natural killer cells. And if you have a decreased immune system, right, then you're becoming susceptible to cancer. Also, folic acid can mask a vitamin B12 deficiency. So if you're deficient in B12, that can cause DNA methylation problems, and that can also set you up for cancer and other downstream problems. Uh, yeah, so folic acid has got a lot of issues. Okay, so MTHFR. Let's get into what MTHFR is, and I'm just going to briefly get into this, okay? So MTHFR is an enzyme which, as you saw, converts one form of folate into another form of folate, and that form is methylfolate. And now, if you have two copies, you have two copies of a gene. One you get from your, your dad, and one you get from your mom, okay? And so if you have the MTHFR677T variant, meaning you have a mutated um, nucleotide base at the 677th position of the MTHFR gene, you have one bad copy. That means you're reducing your ability to uh, convert some form of folate into methylfolate by about 40%. Now, if you have two bad copies of the 677 MTHFR gene, you have upwards of 70% decreased ability to do that. So that means you only have about a 30% capacity to produce methylfolate, okay? So again, if you're taking folic acid, then you have after it gets through all that, those steps, and if you have everything else in working order, you only have about a 30% capacity to produce methylfolate. So that's a big deal. Now, MTHFR A1298 is another type of MTHFR defect. Now, don't, don't worry about these numbers and everything else. Don't let it confuse you. Just know that the 677 variant, one copy is, is pretty bad. Two copies is really bad. 
and the A1298 variant, there's a lot of um, research out there that says it's not that much of a, of a big problem right now, and I am currently not seeing it either, but you have to look at other genes as well. You can't just be looking at one, but that's another detail. Now, if you have one copy of each, such as me, personally, that's called compound heterozygous. That means you have one bad copy of the 677 and one bad copy of the 1298. That reduces your, your capacity also to produce the most active form of folate in circulation, which then decreases your ability to methylate and so on. So this can so, be up in a lot of different ways and different combinations for people, huh? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, just because you have it doesn't mean it's necessarily a problem, but for most of us in the population, especially if we're eating synthetic foods, which are enriched with folic acid, or we're taking supplements with folic acid, and we're not eating our dark leafy greens that are uncooked, then these this enzyme will be a problem. And for the majority of the population in the United States, it's a problem. Mm. Um, so now riboflavin, remember that little yellow circle that we showed in the graph earlier, uh, right here, remember that little red circle, or the yellow circle right above the the uh, the red 5-MTHF, that's riboflavin, okay? So riboflavin, when you have the MTHFR defect, more rapidly falls off the enzyme, okay? So if you have a defective enzyme with the 677 MTHFR variant, that means that riboflavin can't stick on there very well. So if that if that riboflavin can't stick on the MTHFR enzyme very well, that means the enzyme isn't going to work very well. And that also is going to produce the problem. And that's it's a big point. I'm really hammering on this right now because it, it connects to, to the thyroid. Now, MTHFR defects, here are some conditions that they cause. Okay, I, I italicize some because that's, that's just a fraction of what they oh. can cause. Pretty but, list by itself. Yeah, and this this is everywhere. Okay, this is basically every condition because as Dr. Christensen said early earlier that folate metabolism somewhere affects something downstream in your body because it's so central to our biochemistry, and that is why is is MTHFR it can affect all these different things, and these are researched. Okay, now I didn't pull these out of a hat and just randomly list them. Everything that comes out of my mouth or is shown on a slide is is from research. I'm very careful about that. Okay, now who's at risk for MTHFR mutations? So this is looking at the absolute. Uh, I shouldn't say absolute worst form. There's there's even worse forms than two copies of the six seven seven, but that's very very rare in the population. Okay. So, but the Mexicans, Italians, the Northern Chinese, and Hispanics have a very high prevalence of having the homozygous variants. Upwards of 30 to 40 percent of this population have two copies of MTHFR. Okay. And Mexicans, from my uh, experience, don't eat that many uh, uncooked leafy greens. And they also are using a lot of beans, and beans are not the most uh, readily available good source of methylfolate because of the enzymes in beans kind of inhibit the absorption of that folate. So you say, okay, well, what about the, um, say, the black population in, in uh, Atlanta, as this study sh points out at the very bottom of this slide, that's only about 5% that have the 677 variant. Yeah, that's true. That's good. Um, but let's look at the, in general, just the general population across the board on average has about 45% prevalence of having one copy of the bad MTHFR 677 variant. Okay, So one in two of you on the phone right now uh, have MTHFR. Now, don't, don't freak out. There's definitely some actionable steps here. Keep in mind, I have a very significant MTHFR enzyme myself. I'm 39, going on 20, and very active and, and healthy. So it's not a it's not a death sentence at all, especially if you're proactive. And the beautiful thing about this is, is if you identify that you have the anti-Shivara gene defect, you can take action to protect yourself and your loved ones because you can bypass the defect. That's what's so cool about this. So Dr. Lynch, the thing that I think might be coming to mind for a lot of people is, so half the population has this. It causes and contributes to pretty much all the major diseases 
it's probably a big part of why some ethnicities have greater risk of chronic disease than others. Why has there not been more more policy, more procedure, more understanding of this? Great question. And I think it's because research has been showing that MTHFR is only related to elevated levels of homocysteine. That was the research for a long time. And then another study came out a couple years ago, probably a few years ago now, that showed that MTHFR is not really related to elevated homocysteine levels. Um, and actually, you could diagnose MTHFR by simply testing for elevated homocysteine, and if that, if it came back as elevated, then you have MTHFR. But that is not accurate because MTHFR um, is only one path to lower homocysteine. There are other routes to lower homocysteine, which are beyond this talk today. So I think it's just an uh, understanding of the bio lack of understanding of the biochemistry of MTHFR uh, enzyme and what it does, and also the lack of understanding of the homocysteine biochemistry. You and know, the part is that our, our model does well when there's a drug for a condition, but such basic biochemical abnormalities that don't really have a patentable solution, you know, can often get neglected. Yeah, yeah, that's true. There are actually drugs for this, um, quite a few of them actually, but um, they, they're they gaining ground, but not so much because of the research um, saying that it's not that big of a deal if you don't have elevated homocysteine. Gotcha. And yeah, it's, uh, it's beyond that and um, beyond the scope of this talk today, unfortunately. But there is more information uh, elsewhere on, on, on that topic. And you'll be giving us some more resources for that by, by the end. We'll have more ways to learn more from you and access more of that. Right, right. So testing for MTHFR. So the best thing to do is to go to your doctor and say, you know, I have recently found about this out this uh, situation, and I think I'd like to be more proactive in my health. And I, even though I may or may not have elevated homocysteine, I'd like to test for this MTHFR gene defect to see if I have it. Now, if you've had recurrent miscarriages, elevated homocysteine, infertility, um, or drug sensitivity to um, uh, methotrexate um, and some other ones like nitrous oxide, then insurance may cover it, okay? And most labs do uh, test for MTHFR. It's, it's pretty readily recognized. Now, if your doctor kind of looks at you cross-eyed and doesn't understand what MTHFR is, then you could just simply say, you know, Quest and LabCorp do tests for it. Do you, do you, I mean, they, they pretty much have access to those, uh, to lab carrier companies. So you can request MTGFR testing from them. If now, they didn't yeah. end up having that covered, do you like a ballpark idea of what they'd be looking at for expenses? Um, if it's not covered by insurance, it can be anywhere from 35 to 200 to 300 to 400 to 500 to 600 dollars. It, it's a huge range. Okay. It's, it's unfortunate that it's so big. But it is that big, and it could be fully covered to upwards of six hundred dollars. And I don't know why there's such a huge variation in that. I think maybe just because it's not mainstream enough. Um, so the companies that I'm used to working with are Spectracell, Quest, LabCorp. Another one that's not listed as any lab test now that's uh, readily available um, out there across the U.S. And Does Life Extension and Foundation do that? They might. That's a good question. You know, they, they do provide methylfolate, so they might have MTHFR. That's There's a, a couple question. of places. You mentioned the AnyLab now, which is great. There's a couple of resources like that where if someone is paying out of pocket for tests, they can have tests done wherever they are, and sometimes there are amazing, amazing prices for them, too. Exactly. And some of these, like AnyLab tests now, they, they use a cheek swab for MTHFR. So if you don't like needles, and who does, um, you can get a cheek swab and to test for your MTHFR variant. Now, there are some ethical considerations for testing for MTHFR. Obviously, are you ready to be uh, labeled as a mutant? Because, well, we all are mutants. <laughs> that's, that's how evolution evolves, and that's how we as humans evolve, and that's why we're different from each other. But you have to, when you see it on paper, it, it kind of takes a new face to that. And uh, I would say if you're, if you're kind of uncomfortable knowing if you're a mutant or not, Again, with MTHFR, it's something that you can readily bypass and, and be very proactive with. So it's safer to know that you're MTHFR mutant than if you're not. Okay. Now, if you're really gung-ho and you want to know all about these other mutations that are, that are possible, 
you can consider 23andMe.com, and 23andMe.com also tests for MTHFR. And then I don't want to get into it too much detail, but it, you can, once you get your results back from that, that's also a saliva spit test. And you can take your raw data and import that into mtchapartsupport.com, or you can go to geneticgenie.org and get some more genes out of that. Okay. So now let's get to uh, the main heat of this conversation today. And this is just, uh, I guess, maybe to freak you guys out. I don't really know. But this is what I spend most of my time on on a daily basis is this simple little three wheels. Here, the third wheel is kind of a straight line in the bottom there where cysteine goes to glutathione. But if you see where that green text is of 5-10-MTHF reductase, that is the MTHFR gene. Okay. Now, going forward to that is methylfolate. And you can see the blue vitamin B12 right where those two circles intersect. Okay. That's methylcobalamin, or that is, that's actually B12 in various forms. And that's connected to an enzyme right in the middle of those two circles called methionine synthase. So if you can see that huge big wheel does not turn unless you've got adequate methylfolate coming from the left in conjunction with B12. Imagine that as two gears. Okay, You take your left hand and your right hand, and if your left hand isn't turning, your right hand won't turn. Okay. Well. There are some compensatory mechanisms, as you can see, in the right circle. You see that straight line going straight up from homocysteine to methionine, but that straight line going from homocysteine to methionine is only found in the liver and the kidney. So that's great. It's a, it's a compensatory mechanism, but it's not found in all cells in the body like the your, other ones. Your body's got a few backup mechanisms. They don't work in places like, what, the brain or other important areas. Right, Exactly. Right, so that's a it's a big problem. So you can see also why methylfolate is is so critical, and you can also see why masking a vitamin B12 deficiency with folic acid is also critical, and that's because B12 and methylfolate push this huge circle there. And if you look on the right, you see the big dark letters of ADMA, and right above that is SAM. That's commonly known as SAMe. s methionine is commonly known as SAMe. And how many of you guys have heard of that amazing supplement for decreasing pain and um, also supporting uh, those who are with significant depression? Well, you can make your own SAMe, and this is how you do it. So, and a lot of you guys are also familiar with glutathione. And if you look down there on the very bottom, on the far right, the very bottom is glutathione, and that is also uh, being produced through these pathways. So this is this is huge. And the methylation products, you can see that deltol on the right wheel, that's also produced from SAMe. And methylation product could be something like, um, again, CoQ10, carnitine, creatine, phosphatidylcholine, um, histamine degradation, and so on. Okay, so is MTHFR found in thyroid disorders? Yes. Yes, it is. And... So this is looking at Graves' disease and Hashimoto's disease. Graves' disease is basically an autoimmune condition that is attacking your thyroid and it's making it work really, really, really fast and your TSH is really, really low. And Hashimoto's disease is the hypothyroid variation of an autoimmune condition and it's, it's uh, causing your thyroid to uh, produce more TSH, but it also make, it makes the whole system kind of sluggish and slow. Okay, so as you can see here, MTHFR, the 677 variant, is the first column here. So that's the CC and the CT. So C is the good one, CT, and T is the bad one. So T, if you have one T, that is bad. If you have two Ts, that's, that's even more, that's worse. Okay, so they didn't, for some reason, they did not measure the one copy of each of uh, the MTHFR 1298C and 677T. That would have been interesting data to look at, but they, they didn't do it. But anyway, you can see the prevalence of MTHFR in Graves and in Hashimoto's. And it's looking at the prevalence of uh, one copy of 677. It's in 50%, nearly 50% of intractable Graves disease, 53% in remission, nearly 50% in severe Hashimoto's and 50% in, in uh, mild. And as we talked about, 
the prevalence and incidence of MTGFR1 copy of C677T is about 45% of the population. And here you go. This is this is also showing that, but it's um, this is also in a diseased state. So, so would, in- I, would I read this correctly to think that the Hashimoto's severe group and the Hashimoto's mild group would be separate? So you would combine those percentages for the total for Hashimoto's? Yes, that's true. So that's, that's correct. everyone with it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Wow, that's <laughs> amazing. Much. Yeah, and uh, then the 1298 variant, you see that below too, but again, research doesn't really show much with 1298, but it is... It is uh, also classified, they're also found in those with um, thyroid disorders. You know, we've talked about immune function, and, and you've touched briefly upon detox pathways, and the onset for Graves and Hashimoto's is the exact same chain of events. You know, there's some genetic variation in the capacity to transport iodine, and that variation causes more waste to get pulled inside the thyroid like the iodine can. And if someone can't get rid of waste in general, if they can't detoxify because of this, more things will build up. And if there's immune abnormalities, the body is more apt to attack this thyroid, which is now inflamed and full of wastes. And between Graves and Hashimoto's, the differences are just a few molecules. They're very similar diseases. But this blows me away. I've not seen these numbers before. This is basically most everyone with thyroid disease have some issues with this. Right, right. And it's, that's a great statements, and I, I think you'll see why this happens because of how the thyroid affects the MTH of our enzyme, which I never knew about until Dr. Christensen, you know, started pounding on my head and say, "Hey, let's <laughs> start digging into this." And he, he's absolutely right. There's a total direct link between thyroid and MTH of R, and I, I was blown away when I found it. And uh, to support what Dr. Christensen said about immunity and toxicity in thyroid disorders. There are a lot of different studies that link various different xenobiotic or environmental toxins and the thyroid function. So organophosphates, for example, are everywhere, and they definitely affect thyroid function. And if you're not able to get them out of the body, then that's going to cause some issues. But that's, again, another another talk. Okay, so remember we talked about the that little riboflavin, vitamin B2 being necessary to for the MTHFR enzyme to work. And remember when you have the MTHFR677 variant, there's difficulty in that riboflavin to attach itself to the MTHFR enzyme, thus it doesn't work very well. Okay, So you need higher levels of riboflavin in order for MTHFR to become stabilized if you have the mutation. And this is a really important point. Okay. So, and the text here shows that studies um, studies demonstrated that the MTHFR cofactor, FAD, that's the most active form of, of riboflavin, FAD, okay, could protect the mutant enzyme from destabilization, suggesting that riboflavin, the precursor of FAD, which is, again, the most active form of riboflavin, should be considered as a modifier of enzymatic activity and consequence, consequently, high levels of blood homocysteine, okay? So let's look at what this does. So how significant is giving riboflavin for to someone who has MTHFR, 677 variant? Well, look at this yellow statement. Riboflavin supplementation targeted at people who have high blood pressure with the 677 variant of MTHFR can decrease blood pressure more effectively than treatment with current anti-high blood pressure drugs that's only. Amazing. That's huge. So, so this was from Ireland. Do they have higher rates of some of these defects? Uh, Irish. I didn't see a um, a prevalence in the Irish population. Okay, but it's yeah. enough anywhere. So yeah. <laughs> so riboflavin uh, to help our listeners understand some of this. So riboflavin is a B vitamin, and basically the absence of it or the deficit of it would make some of these MTHFR issues even more pronounced. Would that be correct? Absolutely. What what are some of the ways someone would be lacking in riboflavin? Well, a lot of people who are very chronically ill are not eating breads and grains, right? They've eliminated those from their diet, and myself included, 
Um, not because I'm chronically ill, just because I don't like eating any grains. And the Paleolithic uh, movement has also kind of reduced grain ingestion. And riboflavin is also found in enriched foods. And a lot of people who are also ill are not eating these uh, enriched foods. And I think riboflavin, I just read it this morning, but I've already forgotten the sources of riboflavin. But a great source for identifying various nutrients in food is nutritiondata.self.com. So if you go to nutritiondata.self.com, it's a great website. Also the Linus Pauling website at Oregon State University. If you type in Linus Pauling riboflavin in Google, they have a, they'll have a great um, abstract on riboflavin too. Hold up top 10 sources. Um, number two comes up on almost every top list of nutrients. That would be liver. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, who eats that? We eat a lot of liver anymore. Right. Number one, not always useful because that's also a fortified thing is yeast extract. Mm-hmm. Um, almonds have a fair amount. Cheese, wheat bran, okay, fish, sesame seeds, tomatoes. So, yeah, there's some good versions of that. Okay, good, good. Thanks for that. All right. Now, remember I said that riboflavin is the base nutrient that needed to be enzymatically moved into the most active form. Now, we talked about folic acid needing to be converted to methylfolate. Remember all those long enzymatic steps that had to happen in the body to convert folic acid into methylfolate. Now, there aren't as many steps to convert riboflavin to FAD, but there are still steps for that to happen. And what regulates that? Thyroxin. So, thyroxin regulates the conversion of riboflavin to the most active form of riboflavin known as FAD. And remember, you need FAD to con- to help the MTHFR enzyme function. So if you have thyroid disorders, then you are needing more FAD. And if you... Yeah, but you can't form it. But you can't form it. Wow. Right. right. So you are in kind of, I would say, double trouble with thyroid disorders and MTHFR. But if you got Dr. Christensen there and you got Dr. Lynch there to help (laughs) educate you guys on this, then the double trouble gets lifted and a double negative becomes a positive. So I think uh, you're good here. So, But um, the basics here is is thyroxin, which is a thyroid hormone, controls the regulation of, of converting standard riboflavin to the most active form. Okay. You know, I'm sorry, but a little more depth on this. This is pretty wild. So this is really thyroxin. And the distinction I'm thinking in my head is we're talking about T4 as opposed to T3 or T2. You know, there's an argument for having replacement therapy on, on T3 as being an active hormone. My personal preference is to have all of them covered. But if I'm following the thought process here, this could be an argument against T3-only therapy. You know, there could be some. This is a physiologic need for thyroxin a part T4, apart from T3 or T2. And there's not a lot of those. In most cases, T4 is thought to be just a source of the other hormones, but there are a few little things here and there that are suggested that it's needed by itself, and this may be one more thing to add to that list. Yeah, yeah, great point. And, yeah, I've, this is where your knowledge of thyroid starts surpassing mine, and uh, I, I'm going to leave this area up to you to improve. <laughs> Um, but we can work together. This is cool. Yeah. Now, expression of MTHFR and the availability of FAD, remember the active form of riboflavin, in thyroid disorders. Okay. So um, there's a blue thing in my slide that I can't I can't see. Um, but let me open here. Hold on. I can I can uh, cheat. Give me one second. I'm going to restate that really quickly. So the thyroid makes a hormone called T4 or thyroxin, and that's really an inactive hormone. Your body has to convert it and activate it. And what Dr. Lynch is showing here is that some of the needed chemistry of FAD, which is part of your body's central control and working with uh, methylation, depends upon the T4. So those that have been on T3-only therapy, this may be a drawback. And there's so many cases to where if the body does something in a certain way, even if we're not clear on why that is, it's 
probably for some reason, even if that's not apparent at any given point in time. Yeah, great. That was needed. Okay. So expression of MTHFR and active form of riboflavin availability in thyroid disorders. Okay. So we know MTHFR 677 is bad. And and you're going to learn here that it also modifies the risk, means it can increase the risk of coronary artery disease, can also increase the risk of, of colon cancer, okay? And it's related to your levels of homocysteine. And we, we know that the amount of riboflavin availability also affects how MTHFR works. And now we also know that thyroid hormones help support the, the creation of the most active form of riboflavin known as FAD, okay? So the conclusion of this study, which I get into more details in the next coming slides, is the thyroid status does affect the expression of the MTHFR gene. Oh, wow. Okay? So even if you do not have MTHFR, say you get your blood oh. test back and you do not have MTHFR defect, say you're clean as a whistle on the MTHFR, you still have an MTHFR-like inhibition or uh, stopping by having uh, reduced thyroxin. This is okay. this is mind blowing. Also, I had no idea of this. So even right. if you're genetically, if, even if you're in that 0.3 percent of those with thyroid disease that doesn't have this off, there's still going to be problems with the function of the MTHFR with thyroid levels not being right. Right, right, oh. and it's. Uh, I think that makes the population basically at 100 percent, right? <laughs> with, uh, with the prevalence of, of thyroid disorders, and then you add that with the prevalence of MTHFR, it's it's uh, it's not a good combination. Okay. Now this next slide is uh, partially blocked, um, but um, I will. I don't know how to do this. Um, I, I, what I'll do is I'll send Dr. Christensen a copy of this slide that does not have this in-conclusion statement that's blocking it. That, um, so you will see how exactly how riboflavin and thyroid hormone can affect uh, methylfolate production. So, Dr. Lynch, if I can do a quick house, housekeeping piece, uh -huh. an option to, to let the viewers access these slides at a different point? Yeah, absolutely. You yeah. know, I, there was a, we've got a ton of questions that have come in, and some of those were the fact that at first the slides weren't moving freely. They're doing good now, but but yeah, we'll make that available for everyone that they can they can access this and see this. Dr. Lynn sent me a great display in in PowerPoint, and the software for instance, tell someone requires a PDF conversion. So some of the features and movements became disabled, and that was that was just a limitation of our software. So I apologize. So we'll make yeah. this available for people. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so basically. Uh, this is this this was just showing a graphical uh, illustration of of exactly how thyroid does affect um, the MTHFR enzyme and methylfolate, but it doesn't really matter. Um, but the concluding statement here is the present study indicates that thyroid status does affect the expression of MTHFR by modifying riboflavin creation. So this could could partly explain how thyroid dysfunction affects the metabolism of folate and homocysteine, okay? And that is because how the thyroid hormone affects the MTHFR enzyme, correct? Okay, so that's, this is really, really a big deal. And um, now, to make a statement that's also important is if you have a lot of thyroid hormone you are going to be producing more FAD, and if you have more active riboflavin, then you are going to be pushing the MTHFR enzyme faster, and you are going to have a potentially reduced homocysteine level, okay? So if you're hyperthyroid or if you have Graves' disease, then you are producing more of this active hormone, and you are possibly at risk of low homocysteine. And you're thinking, wait a minute, at risk for low homocysteine? Low homocysteine is just fine. No, it's not. You need you need homocysteine in order to produce your SAMI, your glutathione, and other components in your system. It's like saying too low of cholesterol is is healthy, and it's not. You need cholesterol to make your hormones. So it's it's uh there's a healthy level of cholesterol and there's a healthy level of of homocysteine. Okay. Now, if you're 
on the other side of that, now if you're hypothyroid, if you have Hashimoto's, then your production of thyroid hormone is a bit less, so you are not producing as much active FAD or active riboflavin, and thus your MTHFR enzyme is not proving, moving or functioning as well, that means your, your homocysteine is going to be elevated. Okay, So both uh, too much uh, thyroid hormone can, can speed it up too fast, and too little can make it slow. So Good. I thought that was really interesting. That's amazing. And a quick clinical interjection. One of the platforms of my message has been that thyroid hormones are so powerful that we really need just the right amount. There's been the conventional world really disregards the more subtle deficiencies, you know, the more early types of disease. In my view, sometimes the natural world has ignored the dangers of the excesses and has said that, well, you know, unless you have obvious symptoms, it's not bad to have your TSH low or to have a higher dose or something. And this is just one more way in which our chemistry is disrupted by being outside of that good state of balance. Right, right. Okay, now remember this graph, okay? So the the red dashed line is, is circling the MTHFR enzyme, and that yellow dash is SAM, SAME, okay? So as you can see, as we discussed earlier, how important it is to have the MTHFR enzyme working properly so you can produce SAME, okay? And SAME is your main methyl donor in the body. And SAME, if you don't have methylation happening properly, then you don't turn on and off your genes properly, which means what? It means, yes, you, you're not repairing your skin and your, your inside of your intestinal walls and for your uh, intestinal lining, setting you up for inflammatory bowel disorders and so on, but it's also going to set you up possibly for cancer. So this is how MTGFR is, is also linked to thyroid cancers, okay? Mm. So here you go, right here. So the connection between MTHFR and thyroid health is you see the brown circled MTHFR and on the left, and then you see the SAM kind of in the middle. And as you go, as you push MTHFR to work, you are converting homocysteine to methionine, which is great. Methionine is the MET, and then MET goes to SAME. Okay. Now SAME is really needed to control these really critical enzymes in the body, DNMT1 and DNMT3A and 3B. These are DNA methyltransferase enzymes. These are really, really, really important for uh, during embryological development and also in preventing cancer. Okay, So this is a really important slide just so you can understand the, the foundations of why and how MTHFR can cause a problem. Now look at this study. Okay, um, the increased T allele frequency, so the T allele is the bad one, the C allele is good in 677 MTHFR, but don't worry about that, it's just nonsense, you don't need to get it. But the, the increased frequency of the bad MTHFR enzyme is indicated and found in differentiated thyroid carcinoma, okay? So this is an important point, and... So, again, it's nothing to get freaked out about. It's something that you need to get proactive about, okay? Again, this is something that you have to be proactive with your physician in, in properly treating and addressing your thyroid disorders and your MTHFR disorder, both, along with other things. But One little comment here about thyroid cancer. The data suggests that it's the fastest increasing type of cancer in North America today. And perhaps we've had just more people, more years, more toxins to see all this really brew. But the American Thyroid Association and the American Academy of Clinical Endocrinology recommends baseline ultrasound testing for everyone diagnosed with thyroid disease and also regular follow-ups with ultrasound per the appearance of that baseline ultrasound. And, boy, I almost every time I have a new patient coming with thyroid disease, the vast majority have never had that done. And thyroid cancer is such a big deal, and it's really increasing, but it's very manageable at the earlier stages. So along with understanding your MTHFR status, which we'll talk more about here, certainly stay current on your ultrasounds. And if you've never had one, get your first one done, please. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that. That's 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 pretty amazing. And 
uh, it just goes to show that chemicals in our environment and food that we eat is, is critical. Um, so we're going to basically wrap up here so we can answer some questions. But I just, again, I want to leave you guys with a positive note. I'm not into fear-based medicine or, or fear tactics, okay? I, I really want you guys to, to understand. And, and the, the best way to understand this is Bruce Lipton. And I don't know how many of you guys know about Bruce Lipton, but you can Google Bruce Lipton and the new biology, and uh, that's something really uh, good to to watch and learn from him. He he talks about how your perception of the environment controls your own internal environment and genetic expression. Now, remember in the very beginning of this this talk today, I talked about the incidence of MTHFR and neural tube defects. And that's why we started folic acid um, enrichment of foods. Now, and we also talked about how the Mexicans and the Chinese have a very high frequency of the bad type of MTHFR, and they also have a very high rate of neural tube defects, and also the United States as well. Now, if you go to Italy, Italy, as you saw in, in that, has about a 50% prevalence of, of having these bad uh, MTHFR genes, okay? but they don't have an associated risk of neural tube defects. And why is that? And that's because the environment plays a huge role in how the action steps. So it's not, it's not a death sentence that you have MTHFR. You just have to optimize your environment and your diet, okay? Hey, Dr. Lynch, this is a little bit from left field, but to my knowledge, most of the very prevalent persistent genetic disorders in some context had some survival advantage. Is there any theory that way, for example, like sickle cell anemia and malaria or hemochromatosis and bubonic plague? Is there any possible situational benefit to MTHFR defects? That's a good question. Um, uh, readily apparent, I don't see one. And I have a theory on why MTHFR is, is becoming more prevalent. And I think that's because we are with the introduction of folic acid in food that even though folic acid in, in is not the best, it still can convert partially into methylfolate, right? So I think a lot of women who are recurrently miscarrying uh, or were infertile were carrying MTHFR. And so the, the standard of medicine is if you have recurrent miscarriages, the, the go-to thing is to give four milligrams of folic acid along with some, um, you know, hormones and some anticoagulants. So that's the go-to. And if you start, if you start doing that, then I think that we're what we're starting to do is we're our genetics are becoming weakened in society because these these children who are now born um, through, you know, with parents who having MTHFR may be more genetically susceptible to environmental toxicity and so on. And I think it's because we're, we're forcing these long-term pregnancies and successful pregnancies. And so it's, it's a very ethical question and consideration. It's, it's, it's very hard, it's a very hard one to, to think about. Um, but yes, you're right. There's definitely some, some genes out there that are for um, our benefit. And uh, I, I don't think MTHR is one of them, though. So oh, oh, that's a mistype. Okay, action steps. Okay, this is what you wanted to talk about. Yeah, some just big three, five steps. What our listeners should take away from this from um, uh, testing, supplementation. Should they take MTHF if they're not sure? You know, what, what exactly should they come away from this and do differently now? The take-home step is if you if you're struggling with chronic disease and you're not improving, or even if you're super healthy and you're 70 going on 20, then <laughs> you should you should be testing for MTHFR regardless and to see what it is in order to optimize your health, okay? And so you should definitely be testing for MTHFR. You should be de definitely evaluating your thyroid hormones to make sure they're, they are where they need to be. You need to make sure that you're getting your riboflavin and your methylfolate and your B12 and other nutrients, and you can get that through a quality multivitamin and um, uh, go that route. You definitely need to find a physician who will work with you in your biochemistry. And I would also uh, 
realize the importance of the environment and your lifestyle in order to optimize your health. Okay, it's not as simple as taking thyroid supplements or or drugs along with eating um, or, supplement, or, or supplementing with nutrients. Okay, because if thyroid cancer is one of the fastest growing cancers in the United States, and it is according to research and Dr. Christensen, then that means to me that you need to be really, really careful with what you're putting into your body and let food be thy medicine first and doing everything you can with that. And then also not just running out and taking methylfolate because that, that while that can be useful, it can also be causing side effects in people. And there's a lot more information and details on that, uh, which can be available on nthfr.net for you. Um, any your physician. So I would say those are your key points. What else do you have to offer? Uh, would you encourage restriction of, fo- of synthetic folic acid? For people? Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a big one. Yes. Uh, so reading your product labels and avoiding synthetic folic acid. If, you're, if your physician puts you on synthetic folic acid for various forms, so, so perhaps you uh, have recurrent miscarriages and you're currently taking four milligrams of folic acid or you have cervical dysplasia and you're taking 10 milligrams of folic acid, then I would be instructing your physician to say, hey, you know, I, I, I think we need to reapproach this somehow and what can we do? Um, if you're not taking that by order of physician, then just uh, literally throw away your folic acid supplements and switch to folinic acid and methylfolate. I think that combination is best for the general public for various reasons. And, and again, what are the best steps people can take to get more depth with you on this and more information and more training? Okay, so the the best uh, steps is is to go to mthfr.net and um, you can on mthfr.net you can there's free videos there. There's a lot of articles. There's a forum there you can interact with with a lot of people. There's podcasts to listen to, and uh, you can go to my Facebook page at facebook.com. Uh, forward slash dr benjamin lynch and i post there regularly uh, various videos i did a webinar just yesterday on q a and mthfr last week i did another one um, that's also pasted on f- facebook and also mthfr.net now if you're a physician or a health professional and you want to get a lot more training on this and this is something you're currently working on but you you want to gain more knowledge then you can go to uh, bastier.edu, which is Bastier University, you can go to the continuing education uh, area, and there's a presentation, a conference coming up in in middle October, where I'm presenting for two full days, 15 hours of information on methylation and MTHFR and a whole bunch of other genetic defects, and uh, how to optimize that. So, I highly recommend going there if, if that's what you're into. If you're not able to go there, the DVD will be available. You know, a cool thing, you probably know this, but if you put in MTHFR in Google, MTHFR net is one of the first things to pop up. <laughs> yeah. So if you just yeah. again, MTHFR, you'll, you'll find Dr. Lynch and his work. And the training for physicians, I'm really excited about that. I'm going to be participating in that myself for sure. And those of you who are working with doctors, that can be a good resource for them too. You can point them to Dr. Lynch's website and mention the training coming up. That'll be a real, real big event. Yeah, it's, it's already... Uh, pretty large and and seats are filling up quickly and I'm, I'm excited for that there's mds nd psychiatrists psychologists nutritionists from all over the world coming so it's going to be a great venue and i'm really excited about it so check this out dr lynch with our instant telesummer we've got about 10 minutes left before we get the boot in terms of timing i just okay. up the q a page yep at 122 questions right now <laughs> <laughs> come on <laughs> I'm thinking we're going to have to miss a couple of those, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah probably uh, one or two. You know, let me just scroll and see if there's a couple that are representative of others. Um, boy, that's tough. I'm just going to grab this one. 59-year-old female, diagnosed with MTHFR two copies a few months ago, also has factor five and ITP, idiopathic thrombocytic purpurea, with platelets of 24,000, white count of 15.3, had my thyroid checked numerous times, but always comes back normal. Two previous pulmonary emboli, taking Coumadin. Wow. Uh, do you want to make any comments about simple steps for her with the two copies? And I could mention about just more detailed thyroid testing to consider. Yeah. 
the thyroid testing you consider is definitely a big one. And the the two copies, I, I'm assuming people need to specify, please, if it's 677 or 1298. One didn't specify. Anything. Yeah, right. So we'll just assume it's 677. If it's 1298, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, no offense to those who have 1298 and do think it's a big deal. I think there's a lot of things going on in your biochemistry that are causing issues. Um, research is just not showing too much with 1298. But if it's 677, then I would be going to mghbar.net and, and, and reading and watching that video. Um, and I would be basically trying to, you know, support, definitely eliminate your folic acid and don't take that. But I'd be supporting with methylfolate and methylcobalamin, riboflavin and, and betaine and evaluating your homocysteine levels with the... Uh, ITP, you're, you're going to have to be very careful, but that's, that's too big of a question. That's a personal question to physicians only, really. Um, so here's a, here's an easy one. What does ND stand for? <laughs> Naturopathic <laughs> doctor, naturopathic medical doctor per some states, but yeah, we're, we're licensed primary care physicians who have done medical training, but also we've done additional training in natural medicine and biochemistry and nutrition. Uh, here's one. Does T4 and pre T4 tell enough for accurate treatment? with C677T homozygous mutation. Uh, you know, I can even take that one pretty easily. No, <laughs> with or without the mutation, which after today, I would bet the farm you probably do have it to have thyroid disease. Uh, the, free T, the T3 and the, the T4, I'm sorry, T4 total or T4 free alone don't really give enough for accurate treatment by any means. This is something that I see a lot of doctors not clear on as well as patients. The hormones that the thyroid makes, T4 and T3, they're measurable, but they don't really reflect the body's thyroid status. They don't really reflect how much thyroid you're taking or making. They really reflect your thyroid metabolism. So what that means is they reflect how your body is using the thyroid, you know, whether you're trying to get rid of it fast, whether you're keeping it in play for long periods of time. So they're not good bases to judge dosing on, and that's with or without the mutation. Let me see if I can pull up one more real quick here. Um, if one consumes liquid formulas that contain folic acid, does that supersede the reception, not sure of best wording, of folate so that folate isn't attached? So I think the question is about liquid folic acid in higher doses being a problem or being more effective than it would be otherwise. And I'll let you take that, but that sounds straightforward. Yeah, it's folic acid is folic acid. If it's yeah, you a liquid form of folic acid is going to be more absorbable by your system, but it's you're still going to have the same synthetic folic acid that has to go through all those enzymatic steps. Whereas if you take a tablet of folic acid, you know you you might not be able to get it absorbed and readily available into your bloodstream, but you still are going to get some, and you still have to process it through. Now I don't know if you are breaking one of my pet peeves of saying folic acid and you really mean folate or methylfolate. <laughs> so, but the I'm... First thing I said, did, did mean folic acid. They mentioned it a couple yeah. times. And... Okay. Yeah. So I, w I would say that uh, liquid, tablet, lozenge, folic acid, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it should be avoided pretty much. I know a lot of people use that for gingivitis or, or so on for oral rinsing. Um, and I, I would search that out. Is that a concern at all? Does it absorb pretty readily across the, the gums and the membranes? Good question. I I don't know. I would say since it's a it's used as a rinse for gingivitis, I would say yeah, but I I don't know. Okay. You know, one one last question that's going to be really easy uh, is Hashimoto's and other autoimmune conditions related to MTHFR. Dr. Lynch, maybe you and I could email back and forth and look at some of those studies and make a, a proper number. I'm guessing the number is going to be in the high 99 percentile as far as overlap between thyroid disease and MTHFR defects. But it'd be fun to make a hard number to put out about that. But this, this has been amazing information. Yeah, and, and with the way your clinic focuses on thyroid disorders, you know, you start accumulating that data and making, making writing that up in a journal. I think that would be very powerful. Yeah. So closing here, uh, more more email love, more fun stuff coming to you all. I'm going to make sure that we're also going to include some links to Dr. Lynch's information, anything else you may want to include with that, so you can all stay informed of what he's doing. But you'll get some more fun videos from myself, Gina Lee Nolan from, from Thyroid Sexy, some cool videos about common questions and basic steps for thyroid disease. 
and also some info about a boot camp that we did last year, which is just much, much more time with us and lots of depth. But this has been incredible. This has blown my mind. I mean, just the prevalence of this with thyroid disease, the number of ways in which this interacts with thyroid disease, I I thought it would be something of some interest and some relevance, but I had no idea of this mag- magnitude. I just can't can't thank you enough for your expertise on this, Dr. Lynch. Yeah, well, thank you for pushing me to get her done, and, and uh, <laughs> I, I had no idea either. I, I just was researching like crazy, and, and, and to find what we found there is just, it is mind-blowing. <laughs> you know, and... This this is so awesome to get this information out to people and make this clear. This is this is totally groundbreaking. You know, over the next, hopefully over the next coming years and decades, there could be millions and millions of lives saved by this information. And you all are, you know, we're privileged to be in a time to where these things are just coming out and to be on the cutting edge of this. It's just just incredible. Again, just can't thank you enough, Dr. Lynch, and all those who attended. And you know, thanks for your time and interest. And and keep keep the eye on the email. There'll be a lot more fun stuff coming. All right. Thank you, Dr. Christensen. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.